today, we're going to be talking about um, how hemoxylin is one induction by blood feeding arthropods, controls um, skin inflammation, and promotes tolerance to sand fly transmitted uh, leishmania infection. Um, so, under oxidative uh, stress conditions, such as an inflammatory reaction, for example, um, um, that can be uh, that can that, that can result in uh, damage or um, hemolysis of uh, extravascular RBCs, um, and this damage and cell death might uh, release hemoglobin into the tissue. Uh, which contains um, heme um, compounds that can be um, toxic to the to the tissue and promote um, damage and cell death. Uh, in a programmed cell death, that's known as ferroptosis. Um, so um, excess of heme in the tissue will trigger a cell stress response, a protective stress response and the tissue to mitigate its toxicity. And one of the main genes that are triggered and activated in this response is um, uh, Emox1, uh, which will lead to hemoxygenase 1 expression. It's an inducible enzyme uh, that will be expressed in response mostly to its substrate and uh, many other stimuli. So um, hemoxygenase 1 will break down heme and this reaction shown here um, which ultimately will lead to the formation of bilirubin, carbon monoxide, and free iron, which will be transported by, um, um, neutralized and transported by the proteins to prevent ferroptosis and cell death, including uh, ferritin or, or transferrin. Um, aside from its capacity to break down um, heme and mitigate um, tissue damage and cell death, Hemoxygenase 1 is also known to be a master immunomodulator. Um, it has the capacity to antagonize um, the inflammatory reaction. Um, and in fact, there's a growing amount of evidence in the literature um, that have shown that the immunomodulatory capacity of hemoxygenase 1 can afford protection to um, multiple forms of malaria, including cerebral mal malaria, and, um, and the mechanism it's um, it's a mutable. Um, um, uh, there is a plethora of inflammatory pathways that hemoxylin is one. It's known to modulate, including inflammasome activation um, through suppression of NLRP3. Um, hemoxylin is one is also known to modulate T cell polarization by um, creating a Th2 and Treg bias. And recently, it has been shown that um, H01 also is involved in the transcriptional and epigenetic programming of tumor-associated macrophages, or M2, um, that fever and immunosuppressive um, environment in the tumor microenvironment. So vector-borne diseases uh, represent a major toll worldwide. And it is believed that over um, um, half of the world's population is at risk of acquiring a vector-borne disease. Um, um, vector-borne diseases uh, um, together, they um, um, kill over a million people every year. And they are transmitted by um, hematophagous arthropods. Um, which includes mosquitoes, um, sand flies, and ticks. And just a single bout, a bite of those um, vectors can induce, um, can lead to diseases such as malaria and dengue, which represents the most deadly and the most um, incident, uh, respectively, and also um, can also cause leishmaniasis, which we will discuss further details later on. So um, strategies, strategies to prevent um, vector-borne diseases include uh, vaccination um, when it's available, such as for yellow fever and Japanese encephalitis, or, or um, installation of uh, apparatuses that will block uh, access of the vector, including um, window screens um, to prevent the vector from uh, accessing your household when it's a 
uh, flying vector, and also um, use of vests that will um, cover areas of your body, which are usually targeted by the vector. Um, and also use a repellent, insecticide, and also getting rid of uh, stagnant water, which are known to be sites for um, mosquitoes to breed and, uh, uh, and reproduce. So leishmaniasis is one of the vector-borne diseases, and it's considered a neglected disease because it's associated mostly with poverty and malnutrition, so there's not a lot of investments for pharmaceutical companies. Um, so uh, leishmaniasis, um, um, it's it's uh, endemic uh, worldwide, and it accounts it is over one billion people at risk um, living in endemic areas. Um, the cycle we starts with um, uh, infected female phlebotomy that will transmit the infected form of the parasite, uh, metacyclic form, into um, into the host uh, mammalian host here represented as a as a human. And so as the sand fly uh, attempts to feed, it will regurgitate the infective form, the metacyclic, and that um, those promastigotes will infect macrophages and differentiate into uh, amastigotes inside the phagolysome of those cells. And, um, and then they will uh, replicate by binary fission um, and depending on the species and the immunological status of the host, it, uh, the parasite can spread um, not just not, not exclusively from the skin, but it can spread um, to um, other regions of your body. So um, leishmaniasis comprises a um, multiple um, aspect of clinical uh, manifestations, uh, which can be... Um, restrict to the skin in the case of cutaneous leishmaniasis, which will cause a um, ulceration, um, a focal ulceration, or move cutaneous leishmaniasis, which targets the nasopharyngeal mucosa, um, the visceral form, which is the most um, lethal and severe that can spread through your body um, um, and affect mostly liver, spleen, and bone marrow, or the, when uh, when VL it's not well treated, it can um, uh, cause brain, sed brain sedition um, and manifest as uh, dermal leishmaniasis with um, some uh, continuous um, bumps and lesions here shown in this in this picture. So um, cutaneous and mucocutaneous leishmaniasis they cause severe skin lesions that can be um, that can cause lifelong scars and serious, it can be debilitating and cause stigma in people that um, are infected. Um, uh, according to recent um, data, data from the World Health Organization, it's believed that over 600,000 to 1 million cases um, happen um, worldwide. Um, here in the map, you can see in the top um, uh, distribution of cases of, uh, of cutaneous and mucocutaneous leishmaniasis in the world, showing higher incidence here um, in Latin America and countries such as uh, Brazil, and also here in the north of Africa and, and, and in the Indian uh, continent. Um, VL um, is the most, as I said, um, the most uh, lethal manifestation of, of the disease, causing uh, 50,000 to 90,000 cases uh, were wild. And the number of uh, cases, the incidence has increased uh, dramatically um, since the, um, the pandemic of, um, of, of HIV, since the incidence of co-infection is quite high. Um, nevertheless, um, if treated, 90 to 97% survival rate is expected. Um, the disease mostly affects um, children um, under malnourished conditions. And um, the diagnosis and the treatment, unfortunately, it's not uh, the diagnosis, it's, it's still uh, a matter, uh, it uh, still needs to be improved. Um, but um, treatment, it's not available for everyone due to its, due to its high costs, uh, especially in um, continents 
um, that cannot, I mean, like afford and distribute uh, to the entire population. So strategies to um, control leishmaniasis include vector control, um, as represented here, also controlling reservoirs of, in, of infection, which are mainly um, rodents or, um, uh, or street dogs. And also um, um, improving um, surveillance and diagnosis, early diagnosis to treat people immediately and, um, and informing um, social mobilization, strengthening partnerships uh, to um, build awareness of how to prevent and understand the disease. So um, nowadays, it's very well known that um, vector, uh, the vector bite and the transmission of uh, VBD, uh, it doesn't just, um, it's not um, exclusively inoculation of parasites, right, inoculation of pathogen. Uh, the environment that favors optimal transmission uh, involves the pathogen, vector-derived vectors, and also um, signaling pathways um, that are activated in the host skin in response to the bite and to this infective inoculum. So um, when I say infective inoculum, I use that term because there you're gonna find pathogens, but also many vector derived vectors, including saliva, uh, the meat gut microbiome, uh, which um, our lab has studied um, uh, extensively and, and, and demonstrated previously that it's critical for transmission and inflammation. Um, parasite derived exosomes, um, all of that will orchestrate the perfect environment um, to favor parasite subjugment and disease transmission. And certain pathways, especially with regards to um, immune response, are only activated when we are talking about the bite and the, um, and the effective inoculum. Are not there, can, they were, will not be activated exclusively by uh, the pathogen per se. So um, denoculation of the parasites uh, will be done in the skin. So it's known that the skin uh, it can be divided into compartments, the uh, epidermis and the dermis. The epidermis, it's a tightly packed um, um, layer um, that's mostly um, comprised of keratinocytes, um, here shown in orange. And they comprise over 95% of, uh, of the cells in this region. Um, you can also find in the epidermis um, Langerhans cells, intraepithelial lymphocytes, melanocytes, and also um, uh, memory CD8 T cells. Um, the dermis, uh, it's more sparse. It has um, uh, a much um, bigger um, extracellular matrix. Um, um, and a more diverse and a bigger number of leukocytes, uh, which will include um, CD4 T cells, innate lymphoid cells, dendritic cells, and also um, upon um, infection damage or any insult, um, the dermis, it's the region of the skin that gets um, highly um, infiltrated by inflammatory leukocytes, uh, which could be neutrophils and inflammatory monocytes. Um, but among the resident cells in the skin, macrophages represent over 70%, the majority of the myeloid uh, uh, infiltrate in the skin. And uh, most of the studies on host parasite interaction, um, they will either folks, uh, focus on um, the interaction between um, the pathogen and um, also vector-derived molecules um, with um, this um, myeloid infiltrate or the resident myeloid compartment, including uh, macrophages and also lymphocytes. But there is a, um, a side uh, of, the, uh, of the bite of the transmission that has never been um, thoroughly studied before. Um, which is the massive um, leakage 
of extravascular RBCs into the dermis and which and the role that those um, RBCs can play in the inflammatory reaction. Um, and we were very interested in that uh, because um, we have here a combination of skin hemorrhage and inflammation initiated by uh, myeloid resident cells and also the inflammatory infiltrate uh, by neutrophils and inflammatory monocytes. And this creates the perfect environment uh, for production of high levels of hemoxygenase 1. So our hypothesis was that the leakage of red blood cells and uh, along with vector-derived molecules such as saliva and the inflammation mounting at the bite site in the skin would create a favorable environment for high production of hemoxygenase 1, which could uh, modulate skin immunity and inflammation so our specific aims were to evaluate uh, um, kinetics of H1 production at the bite site uh, using uh, multiple vectors of uh, disease um, to determine the role of vector saliva on the production of this uh, enzyme, uh, investigate the mechanism of, uh, of H1 induction, and determine finally the biological impact of AG1 on establishment of vector-borne pathogens. So initially, we, we did um, histological analysis of bite sites after the bite of, uh, of sand flies. And here you can see um, on, the, on the left um, how um, histologically um, the, the skin uh, looks. Those, this is a, a longitudinal uh, cut of the mouse ear that had been exposed for to 20 minutes to the bite of sand flies. And you can see here on the magnification in the bottom that the RBCs are uh, contained within the uh, vasculature. Um, so right after the bite, um, six hours, you can see a massive um, um, in, um, leakage of RBCs um, in the thermos, uh, infiltration of leukocytes and, um, and edema that persists up to 18 hours after sand fly bites. But by 24 hours, um, those RBCs, they have been um, cleared from the tissue and, uh, and, and the skin uh, uh, mostly returns to homeostasis, although you can still notice that uh, uh, um, the vessels um, look um, quite dilated. So this shows evidence that there is a um, um, clearance mechanism, uh, wound healing response in the tissue that will clear those RBCs. So um, to study if hemoxygenase 1 was involved in this response, what we did was to um, expose mouse ears to the bite of multiple vectors, sand flies, ticks and mosquitoes. Um, so we removed the mouse ear, we separated um, 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 both um, um, sat, um, sheets of, of the ear, um, and then we mechanically um, shredded um, um, and we uh, lysed using a ribolysis buffer to obtain a whole skin tissue lysate um, and get total soluble proteins. So from this um, whole tissue lysate, um, um, we ran into a gel um, soluble proteins um, around uh, 40 micrograms. Um, we um, transferred the proteins to a nitrocellulose membrane. Um, and then um, we blocked um, we blocked uh, for one hour with um, 5% uh, milk. Um, um, two washes, we use a primary antibody to target hemoxygenase 1. And then we developed the Western blot using um, chemiluminescence um, with a secondary antibody uh, conjugated to HRP. And we detected using the uh, Azuri 600 uh, biosystem uh, equipment. So as you can see here, um, this set, we used um, the spleen as our positive control. The spleen is a tissue known to express high levels of hemoxygenase 1. And there is high levels of, um, of hemoxygenase 1 uh, detected by Western blot, both the, uh, 
the actual protein and it's in a truncated form compared to um, naive skin. And all of the vectors induced a significant increase um, in the levels of hemoxygenase 1, um, ranging from 24 to 40 hours after the bite. Um, again, both um, the enzyme and a truncated form. Um, we compared the production of hemoxygenase 1 with um, poking with the needle to um, investigate whether just um, a physical um, and, and focal mechanical damage, uh, a physical mechanical damage could um, promote um, any uh, induction of, of a sufficient to promote induction of, of this enzyme. Um, however, we only observed a significant increase in the levels of this protein um, upon um, a vector bite and we didn't see significant increase uh, on its levels when we just poked with a 34 um, gauge needle. Um, and this, it's a densitometry, uh, just to confirm the, um, the data that we saw on the, on the Western blot, confirming um, a significant increase in the levels of H01 compared to a loading control at SP90 um, uh, after the bite of all of the vectors and just poking with a needle is not sufficient to promote um, H01 production, demonstrating that the feeding behavior or, uh, or molecules, they are uh, inoculated by the vector or critical um, as well to um, promote um, H01 induction. And also shows that uh, production of H01 is a universal um, whole skin response to the bite of all the tested vectors, sand flies, uh, mosquitoes, uh, and ticks. So um, to confirm the data that we obtained by Western blot, we collect the whole tissue lysate and then we ran uh, an ELISA. And we confirmed that um, um, the peak of each one production ranges from 24 to 40 hours after the bite of, uh, of all vectors with poor induction of this enzyme um, after poking with a needle. And the levels of H1 induction correlated also with um, hemoglobin um, um, levels um, arise in the levels of hemoglobin um, in the tissue. Um, as you can see here from this picture, the piking, the leakage, uh, the skin hemorrhage caused by each one of those factors. Interestingly, Anopheles gambi did not um, promote um, um, significant in skin hemorrhage in the tissue, but it was still um, 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 efficient in um, inducing high levels of hemoxygenase 1. So to investigate the, uh, the uh, contribution of uh, inoculation of saliva in age one induction, we um, isolated um, salivary glands, we sonicated those glands, um, and we injected interdermally um, 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 salivary gland homogenate from uh, Lutzomyelon palpis and flies and uh, Aedes aegyptite. And we compared with the bite, respective bite of those, um, uh, of those vectors. And, um, and we see that there is a dose um, dependent effect in the induction of humoxenes 1 promoted by uh, vector saliva. Although the levels of its induction are not quite as high as the bite per se, showing that um, saliva contributes to um, AJ1 induction in the whole skin, but it's not the um, only uh, mechanism involved in the production of this enzyme. Um, so to investigate further the mechanism uh, that is triggering hemoxygenase 1 induction, we um, were interested to investigate if the leakage of RBCs would be playing uh, a role in uh, induction of hemoxygenase 1. So it's very well known that there is a specialized subset of erythrophagocytic macrophages that reside um, in the liver and the spleen that are involved with um, recycling um, um, senescent or damaged um, RBCs to support um, bone marrow, marrow erythropoiesis. 
So the specialized, there is a specialized subset of macrophages. They are known as um, um, erythrophagocytes that can be identified by the expression of the scavenger receptors, CD91 and CD163. They are involved with recognition of um, um, components associated with um, RBC damage, um, such as um, heme, um, that is will be like that will be conjugated to a uh, uh, to a chaperone um, emopaxin and CD one sixty three will recognize a free hemoglobin um, conjugated to haptoglobin uh, transported protein that will uh, bind to hemoglobin and CD ninety one is also known to mediate uh, internalization phagocytosis of damaged RBCs. Um, those macrophages, they express very high levels of hemoxone as well. That's why we use the spleen as a positive control for our Western bots. Um, in order to process those RBCs and recycle heme to be um, iron and amino acids to be used in the in erythropoiesis. Um, this subset has been uh, uh, described in the spleen and in the liver, but it has never been shown um, in other sites such as the skin. So to investigate if um, erythrophagocytosis would be playing a role in age one production, we um, conducted full cytology analysis of single cell suspensions obtained from digested uh, uh, mouse skin. And as you can see here, this is our gating strategy. Uh, uh, we gated on single cells and then we, we excluded dead cells. And then um, Using CD11B, um, we um, analyze uh, the uh, myeloid cell infiltrate uh, in the skin. And we observe that 18 hours after sand fly bites, um, um, we detected a, um, a fraction of the myeloid infiltrates that were also positive for this uh, marker, TER-109. It's a transmembrane marker exclusively of the, uh, of the surface of RBCs, uh, indicating that there is a fraction of the myeloid um, infiltrate that had internalized those RBCs. By 24 hours, we see a shift in this population, indicating that they were being um, um, digested, they were being processed intracellularly. So um, here on B in the middle, you can see um, um, significant increase when we compile all of the data in the percentage of myeloid cells that are positive for tel after the bite of both Phobotum sebosti and Lutzomyelogicalpus, a species of sand flies. And also there is significant increase in the total, in the relative cell numbers uh, infiltrating the skin. Um, in order to investigate further um, 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 the myeloid population involved in the internalization of RBCs, uh, we um, backgated um, this population uh, into LY6G um, and C scatter plots. And what we observed is that most of the cells uh, are double negative for both markers, LY6G, that will identify neutrophils, and LY6C um, high that, will, um, um, that distinguish inflammatory monocytes, indicating that this population belongs to the um, myeloid resident um, 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 compartment. So to um, further separate this uh, population based on F over 80 and LY6C um, to distinguish respectively um, macrophages and inflammatory monocytes, uh, we further separate those, um, um, those cells based on those two markers. And in fact, what we saw is that it's a combination of both of macrophages and inflammatory monocytes are involved with internalization of RBCs. So to investigate if we could detect that specialized subset of iron recycling macrophages um, in the skin, we uh, stained macrophages. Um, we used CD91 and CD163 um, scavenger receptors um, on our, uh, we added those markers into our full cytometry analysis. And in fact, we observe um, that there is already uh, a population of macrophages um, that's double positive for CD91 and CD163 already in naive skin, and whose numbers are not significantly impacted by, uh, by sand fly bites uh, as measured 18 hours after the bite, indicating that it's a resident population that's not um, 
um, infiltrating the tissue or modulated by, um, by tissue infiltration. Um, and it's also not uh, multiplying. Um, so interestingly, when we um, um, investigate the staining for CD91 and CD163 among macrophages that are TER119 negative and TER119 positive, uh, which means macrophages that had, in, that had not internalized RBCs, and we compare with macrophages that had internalized RBCs, what we see is that um, um, the levels of CD91 and CD163 positive cells um, are the same in both populations, indicating that those cells, um, this iron recycling population, uh, it's involved in erythrophagocytosis. Um, there is, um, but there is another population um, also performing erythrophagocytosis uh, that does not fall within this um, uh, uh, those two markers. Um, so we cannot discard the possibility that um, inflammatory monocytes that are, uh, that are infiltrating the tissue could be um, also um, involved in um, erythrophagocytosis. And in fact, um, Kenneth uh, Murthy from the University of St. Louis has demonstrated that um, inflammatory monocytes um, upon um, exposure to um, increasing concentrations of heme, they can um, differentiate into an iron recycling uh, macrophages. And that transcriptional dif and, and that differentiation is associated with the uh, transcriptional uh, factor um, uh, spicy C, uh, which is highly uh, regulated upon uh, contact with um, uh, exposure to um, heme. And, um, and they also have demonstrated that if you um, conduct um, adoptive transfer um, on recipient um, animals um, and, and whose, um, whose donor cells had been exposed to a um, um, compound um, PDZ, um, that induces a hemolysis um, in vivo to um, activate, again, those um, inflammatory monocytes to differentiate to spice and C. So um, um, the, the donor also has the spice and C uh, fused to, uh, to, uh, to a GFP, as you can see here, and we'll be able to track the cells that are expressed in spice and C. So upon, uh, uh, so you, you irradiate the, the recipient and then reconstitute with um, uh, either total bone marrow cells or only um, um, monocytes uh, will purify from the bone marrow of, of the donor or you just conduct no transfer at all. And as you can see here, uh, if, if you evaluate later on the spleen of the recipients, these um, inflammatory um, population uh, that were extracted from the animals uh, that, on which the, there were hemolysis in vivo, they uh, will populate um, the, the spleen, uh, um, expressing high levels of spicing C, and they have the same markers um, as the um, specialized iron recycling macrophages that are originally um, uh, residing uh, in the spleen. Um, demonstrated that um, inflammatory monocytes, they can differentiate into our recycling macrophages and populate the spleen um, under um, massive hemolysis and inflammatory situations. Uh, and in fact, when you compare the descriptional program of inflammatory monocytes, they are naive, and uh, this intermediate population that had been exposed to hemolysis and heme, you see that the transcriptional program of, of, um, of this three state of iron recycling, macro, uh, iron recycling macrophages, it's quite similar to the transcriptional program observed on the, uh, on the um, iron recycling uh, macrophages that already resigned um, in the spleen, as opposed to um, poor expression of those markers in uh, the naive uh, monocytes. Um, they're not expressing uh, spicy C. 
So to confirm the um, um, that erythrophagocytosis was happening um, in situ, we performed uh, confocal microscopy um, um, after um, sand fly bite exposure. And as you can see here in the top, um, this is um, one of the um, um, sections that we obtained from uh, multiple events. And we um, label macro, uh, macrophages here um, in yellow. And you can clearly see that they had um, internalized um, RBCs um, here shown uh, in white. Um, some of them have internalized just a single RBC or a, a multiple uh, um, red blood cells. Um, so to confirm the subcellular localization of those RBCs, we conduct a, um, long, um, a um, orthogonal cut of the piled um, c stack images obtained from the confocal. And as you can see here in yellow, um, we, it's the IBA1 antibody, it's any um, specific marker for macrophages. And you can see um, the RBC and the cytoplasmic um, uh, space in um, both of those um, three events. And that's associated with high expression of humoxonase one here shown in uh, red. Um, which it's being expressed both in the cytoplasm and also interestingly uh, in the in the nucleus. And here in the bottom is the um, overlay of those images. So to further investigate the biological um, impact of humoxonase one induction um, for the um, inflammation and pathology promoted by a vector bone disease. We started a collaboration uh, with Miguel Soares from the Instituto um, Cubanca de Ciencia in Portugal. And he um, kindly uh, uh, provided us um, a conditional deletion of uh, knockout mice that was um, uh, induced using the CRE ERT2 um, system, inducible CRE ERT2 system, uh, on which chemoxygenase uh, uh, 1 uh, locks animals were crossed with um, CRE ER2 to um, um, animals uh, on which this uh, recombinase fused to an estrogen receptor that only becomes activated in the presence of tamoxifen. Um, it's under the control of the R26 promoter. So um, when we cross those animals, we have uh, therefore um, uh, the CRE ER2 recombinase being expressed um, constitutively but it's not active unless you administrate tamoxifen. So once you administrate tamoxifen, the, uh, the estrogen receptor becomes activated and will activate the recombinase and allow its um, nuclear translocation. And then the recombinase will target um, um, any things that are flanked by the LOX uh, P region, and in this case, your hemoxygenase 1, leading to the excision of, of the gene and its deletion. So um, we infected um, thousands of sand flies of the species Phlebotomus zuboski with Leishmania major. And then we gave them a, a, a second blood meal um, to, um, we have demonstrated in our group that a second blood meal increases um, the infectivity and, 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 and favors um, an optimal um, transmission. So um, all of the pathology experiments were done with pair of, of sand flies that, um, um, that received a second blood meal. So we transmitted on day 12 once the infection is mature and there's a significant level of metacyclic parasites infected form. Um, and we compared the disease outcome between um, hemoxonase one lux and knockout mice. And we follow um, the pathology by uh, the lesion um, diameters um, weekly up to week five. And as you can see here in the in the bottom left, um, the um, knockout mice, they um, uh, presented significantly higher uh, pathology compared um, to the LOX throughout the course of infection um, um, with significantly bigger diameters uh, of uh, cutaneous lesion, here shown in red. But interestingly, um, we didn't observe any differences in the in parasite loads um, in the in the skin, uh, neither in the lymph nodes. Although I'm not showing here. Um, so um, to evaluate 
um, if just a transient inhibition of hemoxylinase 1 um, after transmission would be sufficient to promote the same um, phenotype. We treated those animals, we followed the same protocol, and we treated those animals with SNEAK, a um, selective inhibitor of hemoxylinase 1 activity um, the day prior, the day of transmission, and 24 hours after to uh, uh, assure a sustained inhibition of hemoxylinase 1 during the acute inflammatory reaction. And then we follow um, the lesion diameters weekly, again, up to week four. And again, we observe a similar phenotype with um, a higher um, pathology um, once uh, the enzyme had been uh, inhibited, here shown in red, compared to animals that receive vehicle. And again, we didn't observe any, observe any significant impact on parasite loads. So, which demonstrates that um, um, chemoxygenase 1, it's promoting undisease tolerance to Leishmania infection, since it does not affect parasite replication, but affects the capacity of the host to tolerate infection um, with um, minimal tissue damage. So to investigate the mechanism by which hemoxygenase 1 um, was um, a promoting um, disease tolerance to infection, we hypothesize that H01, since it's an immunomodulator, it could be um, affecting um, the inflammatory reaction. So we conducted a targeted transcriptional analysis of, of genes involved with um, acute inflammation at the side of the, at the side of sand fly bites, um, including um, IL-1 beta and uh, some chemokines. And what we observe is that uh, uh, transient inhibition of H01 leads to a dysregulation, the inflammatory reaction characterized by higher expression of IL-1 beta. Um, CXL1 uh, and CCL2, chemokines known to induce a neutrophil and inflammatory monocyte infiltration. Um, also, um, higher um, um, expression of kidneys like 3 uh, protein um, involved in um, 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 tissue repair and also um, um, neutrophil infiltration, um, and also FBN1, an iron um, exporter protein um, that could be potentially in associated uh, to a uh, compensatory mechanism due to the accumulation of heat. So um, uh, we moved on to analyze whether um, uh, this um, dysregulation, the transcriptional um, um, in the transcription of inflammatory uh, molecules will reflect into a higher infiltration of leukocytes. So indeed, by flow cytometry, we analyzed the infiltration of uh, uh, neutrophils and inflammatory monocytes, and we observed that um, uh, inhibition of Asia 1 leads to um, higher infiltration of neutrophils and uh, inflammatory monocytes, and not just higher infiltration of, of those cells, but neutrophils, um, they also uh, presented a borderline significance with regards to the um, um, expression of CD11B, a known marker of neutrophil um, activation. So um, previous observations done by our group have demonstrated that um, um, Ingestion, regurgitation of the mitigate microbiome leads to inflammasome activation and higher production of IL-1 beta um, from neutrophils, which leads to an autocrine um, loop um, that um, elicits um, continuous infiltration of, of neutrophils and secretion of IL-1 beta, uh, which will um, ultimately um, favor parasite dissemination to the lymph nodes. And we have shown that the microbiota is critical for the mechanism since um, treating um, sandy flies with antibiotics, um, therefore clearing the gut um, from its um, microbiome, prevents um, inflammasome activation, um, neutrophil infiltration, and ultimately there is no um, parasite dissemination to, uh, to the spleen. Um, those observations have been done with Leishmania um, donovani. Uh, so we wanted to confirm um, if um, Leishmania major 
uh, transmitted by Flotimus Dobosky bytes will lead to a similar pattern. So uh, flow cytometry analysis show uh, um, a peak of neutrophil infiltration um, at six hours after the bite um, that becomes diluted as inflammatory monocytes um, uh, arrived in the, in, the, in the tissue and become the, uh, the major population by 48 hours. Um, when we um, investigate um, the peak of island beta expression um, production is also uh, it is, it's at the same time as the peak of neutrophil infiltration at six hours. And when we backgate this island beta positive population, we see that um, although there is a resident population that remains um, mostly um, constant in the tissue that is already expressing a poor island beta, um, um, the excessive, the um, extra amount of alum beta that, um, that, um, that increases in the tissue comes mostly from um, neutrophils, um, even um, at, uh, at later time points where inflammatory monocytes are already there. So um, to investigate whether uh, the suppression of uh, the inflammatory reaction by hemoxygenase 1 will be through carbon monoxide, uh, which is a byproduct of the uh, of heme catabolism and hemoxygenase 1 uh, activity. Um, and it's known to play a role as a suppressor. We um, did the same protocol with sand fly infection and we transmitted, and then we treated those animals um, interdermally with quorum 2. Um, uh, which is a donor of, of carbon monoxide. So um, we injected internally two hours after transmission, and then six hours after the, after the bite, we performed flow cytometry, and we evaluated neutrophil infiltration and neutrophil production of myeloma beta, since we know that uh, neutrophil infiltration and uh, production of, of this chemokine plays a major role on the acute inflammation mounted at the site of the bite. So although um, um, CO was not sufficient to affect um, significantly um, neutrophil um, infiltration, we did observe a borderline significance here, um, but it's, it's still not significant. We observed around uh, 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 significant suppression of the levels of ILM beta um, produced um, by, by neutrophils upon um, administration of quorum 2, reducing uh, the levels of neutrophils that are positive for IL-1 beta um, to um, 40% um, compared to, um, to the vehicle, uh, which demonstrates that carbon monoxide can uh, suppress IL-1 beta production um, directly from neutrophils. Um, so if you're interested to know like more details of this paper, we have recently uh, published on cell reports. And as a summary, we have um, demonstrated that um, H01 um, production is a universal whole skin response to the bite of mosquitoes, ticks, and sand flies, main vectors of disease. Um, then we produce skin hemorrhage and inflammation, which creates a favorable environment for H01 production, which will break down heme. Um, um, producing the following um, products. And we have demonstrated that carbon monoxide can directly um, inhibit um, ILO beta production by neutrophils. Um, um, in the context of uh, uh, in the context of a vector bite, and the production of uh, hemoxygenase 1 can also suppress um, um, CCL2, CXL1, which will ultimately impact um, leukocyte um, infiltration. Um, as opposed to a scenario on which um, hemoxygenase 1 is inhibited, what we see is a dysregulation of the inflammatory reaction with um, significantly higher levels of those um, cytokines and chemokines, a massive infiltration of leukocytes and excessive tissue damage. So the host loses its capacity to tolerate infection um, um, to Leishmania. So um, pre with regards to the mechanism, we see that AG1 production is triggered in response to um, vector saliva and erythrocytosis of RBCs. We have identified a specialized subset of iron recycling macrophages um, that reside in the skin 
and express, uh, it can be identified by the expression of the scavenger receptors CD91 and CD163. Um, and thank you, that's it. Um, happy holidays. I'm open for questions now.